I believe today FMCG companies have become very slow. It's actually the opposite. Today, who are the agile guys? It's actually the tech companies. And FMCG companies have consistently lost their agility in embracing technology. When I went to Nokia, I recognized that we can't sell mobile phones if the operator is not successful. You'll, you'll be surprised. In 2007 to 10, we used to track BSNL subscriber base because BSNL used to go rural and they had towers better than Airtel or Vodafone or Idea. When I worked in PepsiCo, PepsiCo was unprofitable for I know, 20 years till we had to make it profitable. We had to take out $200 million of cost to make it profitable. Okay, you have to run a profitable business. Trust me, no employee wants to work for an unprofitable company because you know why? Your job is at stake, your salary is at stake. You don't want that. You know, you have a vast array of experience in the consumer goods uh, technology space. Um, you know, before we get into the CPG industry, I would love to understand your career journey and how you picked this field. How I picked this field. Fantastic. Okay. Uh, great. Thank you very much. Uh, it's an absolute uh, delight to be here this morning at the Masters Union. Uh, I've read a lot about you guys and I'm amazed at... Uh, the rapid progress that you've made, uh, because I sit on a few of the boards of business schools right now, and I'm constantly urging them to change. And B school professors are the worst people to change. They talk a lot about change, <laughs> they don't change at all. Okay, I hope your professors are not like that. And Masters Union is a great example of change, and uh, I'm really happy that uh, you guys are here. Uh, it's a fantastic uh, campus. Uh, you have all the facilities, and I'm sure that you guys will do a great job. And you'll be great ambassadors for Masters Union uh, in the coming days and months. So going back to your question, you know, in life, you never know what you're good at. You know, it's surprising, but that's true. Okay. So, and I would say there are some defining moments. When I was in school uh, moons ago, uh, we were asked to write, I was in boarding school, and I was, we were asked to write an essay about radio. Okay. And I remember my first line saying, I'm asked to write about an invention from Marconi, blah, blah, etc. So when the teacher gave out the mark sheet, her name was Mrs. Mark. She was our English teacher. Outstanding lady. Uh, real profound influence on a few of my classmates, including myself. Uh, so I had the best marks in class, which was 66 on 100. 66 on 100 today would be fourth class or fifth class, right? <laughs> But those days, the best mark was 66. They were really tough on us. You know, they were not easy on us. Marks never flowed like uh, water like they do today. You know, today 99.5 seems a failure. You know, 66 was a uh, uh, best uh, thing. So she said, Shiv, can you stay back after class? I said, sure, ma'am. So I stayed back after class. Imagine I'm 10 years old, standard five. She says, Shiv, you write well. Don't ever give up this habit. When you're 10, nobody tells you you're good at anything. Think about it. Your parents don't tell you, your uncles don't tell you, nobody tells you you're good at anything. For a teacher whom we respected, for her to tell me, wow, you know, you write well and you must continue. And that sentence has rung in my head and I've consistently written right through my life. So I was editor at school, uh, I was editor in college, in both the colleges, etc. And I've consistently written for the business press. Then when I went to IIT, I used to do a lot of co-curricular activity. I was also the secretary of the institute. My seniors there, people like Shanti Kumar Senati Rajan, uh, TM Narayanan, uh, Anand Reddy, these guys saw me when I was a second year student you know, in the 80s and said, Shiv, you have management potential. You must go to an IIT. I didn't think about it myself. Can you believe it? But those guys said, you know, you have management potential. We can see it in you. I was editor of the campus magazine. I was student secretary. So then I went to IIT. Then when I went there, uh, I got fascinated by marketing. Okay. I didn't know the principles of marketing as they were, but I was practicing them maybe both at IIT as well as in school or college. Uh, but then you learned about marketing, etc. And um, in IIM, I got fascinated by the theoretical concepts and what we should do. And believe it or not, you'll find this uh, really funny and as a joke. I used to write to all the professors in the world when I was at IIM. I've written to Peter Drucker, I've written to Ted Levitt, I've written to Benson Shapiro, I've uh, written to Yoram Wind, all the top professors of the mid 80s, I've written to them and said, you know, I like this article of yours, can you send me more articles? And I would get 20, 30 articles of this. 
So I was the butt of a lot of jokes in my class, saying, look, this guy is already professorial. He doesn't want to you know, be an MBA, et cetera. Uh, and then I said, OK, if I want to do marketing, then I must really sharpen my skills in marketing. And I did a lot of work on that and then landed up in the right places. So my lesson to you would be that others seem to judge you and your strengths much better than you can judge yourself. Because I think fundamentally, you have two types of people. Either you're over the top and arrogant and boastful, or you're reasonable, but others see in you what you cannot see in yourself. I come from a family of bureaucrats and doctors. Okay, uh, We have a lineup of IPS, IAS, uh, dad, etc. My parents wanted desperately for me to do an IAS or an IPS. They were so disappointed when I went to an MBA school. You know, they're so disappointed, I can't tell you. Uh, and uh, doctors, you throw a stone and we have a doctor of every type. My brother's a doctor. You know? So <laughs> for me to be not a doctor and not a bureaucrat was actually a very different journey. So that's how it happened. Nice, great. Now um, that you've talked about, you liked marketing, and there are many of our students, you know, who want to get into marketing. Uh, and obviously, CPG industry is one of the fields that you want to go to when you're interested in brand building. Can you talk us about the key trends which are shaping the CPG industry today? And what are the consumer behavior changes that are driving those uh, shifts in the industry? Yeah, so if you look at CPG industry, and you need to go back in history, Okay, uh, the CPG industry by definition it's called consumer product group, or some people call it fast moving consumer goods, whatever you call it. Typically, it is products of daily use. Okay, products which have a low unit price, products which are stocked in multiple number of outlets. Okay, that's typically the definition. Okay, of CPG or FMCG or whatever you want to call it. If you go back in the history of CPG, and it's important to understand this, uh, consumer product companies did not have any control over the distribution channel or what they did in the early days. So Procter & Gamble was one of the first companies. Uh, they were my competitor for a number of years when I was in Unilever. I have a lot of respect for them. I learned a lot from Procter & Gamble. And uh, today I find the concept of bissing on competition actually a bit silly because I learned a lot from all my competitors, uh, whether it is uh, Procter, whether it's uh, Motorola, whether it's Coke, I learned a lot from them. And I'm always grateful to them for that. So they used to sell through wholesale. So the wholesaler controlled what stock was kept and what stock was sold to the retailers who came in to buy from wholesale. So Procter & Gamble was one of the first companies to, they went to the wholesaler and said, please, can we put a poster? We just want to put a poster near your shop. So the wholesaler, he didn't know the future, obviously. He didn't see the future. He said, go ahead. So then they put a poster. It said, ivory, the soap that floats, you know, which was one of the early things, innovation, the ivory would float, the other soaps wouldn't float. And suddenly, the retailers would come and say, we want that soap. And that's when the first concept of branding started. Hmm. So branding started actually with posters at wholesaler points. That was the first point of control. Okay. Then after that, the proctors of this world, the big companies said, hey, you know, we can control distribution. Let's go all the way. So then this, they said, who are the wholesalers who come to this? Who are the retailers who come to this wholesaler? Let's talk to them. Where do you come from? So then they started serving them there. Okay, as long as they had economically viable quantity. So they went there. Then when radio started, then Proc Procter & Gamble, as well as the big companies, were the first to embrace radio. Uh, Coca-Cola was another first company to embrace radio. Then when television started, you have the concept of the idiot box or the soap box. Why is it called the soap opera? Because uh, Procter was the first company to sponsor the serials on television. And there was a soap company. That's why it's called a soap opera. Okay, so every new medium which came in, the FMCG companies dominated that. Okay, that's what they did. Then cut to the 1900s, the biggest innovation which actually came into FMCG was barcode. Hmm. Barcode was started by uh, Wrigley. The first product ever to have barcode was Wrigley. And what barcode did was to ensure that you had price not marked on pack. Nobody need to remind the price. Yeah. Tuck. You had inventory, you had everything you could check. Okay, so that's what they did. 
FMCG also pioneered the concept of management in a different way. Brand management as a concept, as you know. How many of you want to be brand managers? Okay, about okay, 10, 12 people. It's the best job I ever had, you know? The best job I ever had, I just love being a brand manager. Okay, so uh, the concept of brand management was started in Procter & Gamble, May 13, 1931. Okay, when Neil McElroy read the, wrote the famous note saying, people don't worry about CAMA the way they should, he wrote a two-page note. Then category management was started by Procter & Gamble, uh, sorry, uh, Colgate uh, Global. So these companies were at the forefront of early packaging innovation, early distribution innovation, early management innovation. Okay, that's why they had a standing. If you look at India, India FMCG companies have always controlled distribution. Okay, the more distributed you are, the better it is. It's not a strength anymore in a world which is completely digital. Okay, the second thing they did was they thought they owned the brand. We know how to do brand marketing. And the third was, which was very unique to India, all of them ran on negative working capital, which is what they paid their people or their supplier system was many more days than what the money they got from the distributors. These are the three fundamental things, etc. However, if I come to today, I think all those strengths don't exist. Distribution is no longer a strength. Today, a small brand in Gurgaon can run you know, past any of the big boys or girls easily. Today, you have the advantage of targeting much more sharply. Much more sharply. Today, brands can be built very quickly digital compared to it used to take five to 10 years, etc. Okay, and so I believe today FMCG companies have become very slow. It's actually the opposite. Today, who are the agile guys? It's actually the tech companies. And FMCG companies have consistently lost their agility in embracing technology. Okay, they did not partner with organized trade in India and globally they did. They didn't partner with the Facebooks or the Googles or the Amazons or whoever it is. That's where the future is. Now, those guys have much more data than the FMCG companies ever have on their consumers. They have much more on the preference and the price points, etc., than they have. So, I believe FMCG is at the crossroads. If they do not effectively partner with ecosystems, specifically technology ecosystems, then their days are numbered. Yeah. Fair. And you also, that is the reason I think you see a lot of brands like Mama Earth, right? Or, or other D2C brands like Bombay Shaving Company, which have come to the forefront uh, where these uh, earlier brands were under the umbrella of HUL, PNG. And now these companies are investing in these new D2C brands rather than coming up with their own, uh, you know, tech brands who can be sold online and offline. Yeah, th there's a reason for that, uh, Swati, which is, you know, in FMCG, what do you do? You identify a need, you introduce a variant. Yeah. Okay. Sometimes you go too far. I used to run hair care for uh, Unilever. Uh, I used to run this region also. Uh, at one point of time, Procter & Gamble, my competitor in Pantene, they had 72 variants of shampoo. There are no 72 variants of hair in the world. <laughs> Think about it. Every new brand manager, there's a new brand manager, Shiv Kumar, he introduced three new, three new, new variants. variants. Swati follows Shiv Kumar, she introduced three more, and nothing's gone. Okay, now what happens when you introduce variants is the sales team and everybody is very tired of these variants. They have no clue how to sell it, they don't want to sell it. Okay, so what looks like a great product and great opportunity in the boardroom is suddenly a dead duck when it goes to the market on day one because the distributor doesn't order it or whatever it is. So take Mama Earth as an example. One of the girls who used to work for me in PepsiCo, Anuja, is there. Hmm. as marketing head, wonderful girl. Sulfur-free shampoo, sulfate-free shampoo as an example. It was there always, but for a big company to put it out and even sell one ton of, ton of it would be a Herculean task. Because big companies are not used to small volume, whereas small companies think big volume. That's the fundamental difference. Big companies have committees, small companies have commitment. Okay, big companies have not invented here, we've done it in the past, etc. Small companies have hunger to say, I want to beat the big guy. Hmm. Okay, so whether you work in a big company or a small company, you must think like a small company person. That's when you'll succeed. 
So that's the reason. So today they can target very specifically sulfate free, this free, gluten free, etc, etc. And suddenly you can target virtually by pin code. Yeah. Okay, you can target brilliantly. And hence, that degree of targeting and that degree of sharpshooting has actually helped a lot of the small companies do far better. Mm. That's what's really happened. Did the big company see the opportunity? I can always tell you, the big companies saw the opportunity a long time ago. But they were unwilling to... Execute on it. Absolutely, un unwilling to go on it. Yeah. Okay, that's like I mentioned, uh, I said Masters Union is a great thing. The top... I am Andhubad and I am Calcutta have been 1951, so many, 72 years. Mm -hmm. They've been there. I don't think they've changed much. Okay, they have people like me on the board who are telling them to change, but they still don't want to change. What does that tell you? There's an inertia. And I keep telling them, look at an ISB. Tomorrow I'll tell them, look at a master's union. Look at where they're going and what has stopped you? Nothing stopped them. Many times in big organizations, many times in big teams, it's inertia, and arrogance which stops you. You think you know it all. The day you become humble and say, I want to learn, I want to try, I'll try small experiments. Hmm. Maybe the sulfate-free shampoo will be one-ton idea. Doesn't matter, let me try. I'd rather try it and fail rather than judge it without trying. Fair. So, Shiv, you have led big brands like Pepsi and they have continued to remain the market leader. And when you're talking about these examples where small companies are coming, taking over because they are iterating, experimenting, how were you able to drive innovation in Pepsi? So, the thing is, <clears throat> whenever you have a brand or whenever you have any business that you take over, or whatever you do, what, whatever type of business, <clears throat> look ahead and say, how will this business look five to six years out? Mm -hmm. How will money be made in this business five to six years out? Money will not be made the way it's made today. Like for example, as I mentioned, today all B schools run on fees as the business model. I can tell you right now sitting in front of you, five to ten years from now, it will not work. Hmm. You'll have to find different streams of revenue. Fees will not be the only dominant model. It will be a model, but not the dominant model. And finally is, what type of capabilities and people do you require to be in the future? Let me give you a, a very good example of this. A good example of this is uh, Bollywood movies. Okay, both pro and con. How many of you watch Bollywood movies regularly? All hands up, good. So if you go back, 90s, about 90s, mid 95, the success of a Bollywood movie depended on distribution. The number of reels you printed, and the number of theaters you put it into. 200 theaters, 400 theaters, 1000 theaters, etc. Okay. So, if you take a place like Bangalore, where I come from, you have Minerva Theater, and then you have Apsara Theater. Minerva would start the movie at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Apsara would start the movie at 2.30. Why? Once the first reel is done, an auto rickshaw will take the reel and go to Apsara so that they can run it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Second, Ticket prices were capped, 6 rupees, 7 rupees maximum, balcony was that. Suddenly, the government said later, ticket prices are no longer a challenge. Suddenly now you have ticket prices at 200 bucks, 300 bucks. You have Inox, PVR, mini theaters coming up. Now, if you run a movie for two weeks, you're a hit. In the old days, you have to run it for 25 weeks. Because the ticket price was five bucks. The capability was distribution. Suddenly the capability is marketing now. You need to get 200 people into a theater for 14 days for your movie to be a hit. So you create controversy, you create whatever it is, etc. And I was in Hyderabad the other day and I saw this, you know, 25. I said, wow, the poster. I said, this movie has run for 25 uh, weeks. I looked at it closely. It said 25 days. <laughs> so metrics have changed. Yeah. So you forget it. So the capability of what was there in the movie industry, which was distribution, is no longer the capability today. Next, even before the movie is released today, going back to your business model example I gave you, hmm. Indian movies sell the music rights globally and make more money. Yeah. Do you get it? Now suddenly your ability to sell global music rights, your ability to get audience into the hall for the first two weeks, that's enough. It's a completely new capability. The same Bollywood, which was damn good, learned this, mastered it, etc. 
went back and sat on its backside. And what did this? They started aping Hollywood. They started making chiclets. They thought dance was their form, etc. They forgot that movies people go for escapism. Suddenly, you had a bunch of guys from Tamil Nadu and Andhra Pradesh that Natu Natu and all that. First time I saw the Natu Natu song, I said, "Wow, look at that energy." That's what people want. The more you know, people are stressed, the more they want that escapism. Well, uh, Bollywood is trying to do some you know romantic whatever rubbish that they were trying to do. <laughs> They lost badly, so an industry which actually changed and then didn't change after that is a great example. So you have to constantly challenge yourself to say, even as individuals, what are my skill sets? Are my skill sets, you know, valid five years from now? Is the industry I am in valid five years from now? Where do I need to be? If you don't ask those questions of yourself, you're going to fall back. Whether it's a country, whether it's a company. Whether it's an individual, all three will fall back. Fair, fair. So continuously evaluate and know that five years down the line, your business yeah, yeah, model yeah. is going to change. So how do you stay, yeah. uh, you know, ahead? Fair. Now, Shiv, I'm going to change the gears a little bit, right? Uh, you've worked in global MNCs, uh, and obviously, as you said, running a small company is easy. But when you're being led uh, at the global level, right? There is international expansion. Uh, there are cultural differences, and companies uh, might not be knowing what is relevant for that market, right? So, how have you seen, um, you know, companies approach uh, when they run at that level of international expansion or, uh, you know, management at the global level? Yeah, the the thing about global corporations, and I wrote about this on my LinkedIn because. I had to do a session on Jan 21st on are multinationals relevant in a future world and why are they losing? I looked at the top 100 multinationals. The global GDP had grown at 3.4 percent in the period 2010 to 2021, and the top 100 multinationals had grown at 3.8 percent. The eight tech companies in the top 100 had grown at 8.4 percent or something like that. So fundamentally. Global corporations, whether it's FMCG, whether it's non-FMCG, they become giant bureaucracies. The reason they become giant bureaucracies is that any information is available to you in the next minute. So suddenly all decision making and everything goes up the chain quickly. Yeah. So now what you want your big country to do is only execute, which is a shame. Because your big country people have lots of brains. And hence, where are multinationals losing? They're losing to small, nimble competitors in each country. Be it China, be it India, be it Brazil. They're losing to a number of small companies. Because they are agile, they're able to see the opportunity much more. The way to deal with this always is to consistently paint the picture with the consumer evidence. To tell them this is what it is. So whether it was Nokia, whether it was PepsiCo, one of the things I'd do is, every time we had international visitors, I tell the team, okay, this person has landed last evening. First thing in the morning, 9 o'clock, please take him to the marketplace. <laughs> let him go see the market. Let him go see the retailer. Let him go see the market. Let him see how our products are displayed. Let him see competition. Then after that, in the afternoon, please take him to a few consumer homes. For him to understand how consumers really live, how consumers buy, what they, what is their priority, etc. And then next day, please bring him for the hmm. meeting. Then let's discuss. Now, what happens in every global organization is there's a guy from head office who comes, there's a person from India or China, and the two of them are arguing with each other on this is the way I see life. I think once that person has actually seen the trade and he's seen the consumer, he has a better sense because then he knows what works, what doesn't work. Then you have to agree to say, what are three things we agree on, both of us? We want to grow the brand. We want to do this, we want to do that. Let's focus on that. Let's throw the differences out of the window at this point of time. Quite often, we're trying to prove to each other that we are smarter than the other guy. So suppose you come from head office in PepsiCo. I want to show you. I want to show Swati that Shiv is very intelligent. Yeah. You know, I want to be one up on you, which is a, you know, a zero-sum game. Yeah. Because both of you are interested in winning with the Indian consumer, right? Yeah. So as long as you put that and say, what are the three things we agree on? Really focus on that. That's the way, unfortunately, to manage global corporations. I personally believe till you truly have uh, empowering leadership, people are willing to listen, 
more than they're willing to talk in global corporations, this will not change. Fair, fair, fair. Um, and when you were there, right, you were managing um, a range of stakeholders, not just the global offices and the global headquarters, but also your own shareholders here, your, um, you know, employees here, customers. So how are you managing? What are the tips and tricks of uh, sustaining a global corporation and managing all the stakeholders at once? Yeah. So whether it's a global corporation or even managing in India, Hmm. I think tomorrow's world, or even today's world, is not a battle between brands. It's a battle between ecosystems. Remember this. For example, I still carry a Nokia phone. Nokia is an Android ecosystem. People in, in the audience who have an Apple phone, you're on the iOS ecosystem. Okay. If there was Blackberry, they were on the RIM ecosystem. Hmm. Okay, so tomorrow and today is a fight between ecosystems. So let me, when I grew up in FMCG, I didn't really worry about ecosystem or think about ecosystems. But when I went to Nokia, I recognized that we can't sell mobile phones if the operator is not successful. For example, you'll, you'll be surprised. In 2007 to 10, we used to track BSNL subscriber base. Because BSNL used to go rural and they had towers better than Airtel or Vodafone or Idea. So we had to work with these guys. So when Manoj Kohli, who's also Wharton, was a CEO of Airtel, we wanted to go rural. Okay, I'll give you two examples. So Manoj called me and said, Shiv, let's go rural. Let's put a thousand vans into rural India to sell mobility. So let's bear the cost 50-50. I said, sure, Manoj, works in your interest, works in my interest. Let's go do it. We did it, hugely successful. Okay. In 2005-06, when I joined Nokia, you won't believe it. There are only 80 million subscribers in India. Today, there are more than a billion. Okay, so one of the things we did between Nokia and the operators was that. Next, after two years, we looked at groups and said, who are the people who don't have a mobile phone? And it, it was women in rural India, mothers in rural India. They didn't have a mobile phone. So we went to them and asked them, why don't you own a mobile phone? They said, 1,500 bucks, I can give it to my daughter for education or my son for this. Do I really need a mobile phone? I don't think I need a mobile phone. We knew that answer was wrong. If we just listen to her as it is, which is what I call consumer decided, then it's wrong. We know that she wants a mobile phone, but you have to provide a different answer. So we told her, fair enough, you're saying 1,500 bucks is a problem. What if we gave you the option of paying 75 rupees a week for 25 weeks, and then you own the mobile phone? She said, that's workable, yeah. can do it. How do you do it? We went and looked, scanned the environment, and SKS Microfinance, okay, used to give loans to women entrepreneurs. They would give loans to women entrepreneurs only on the condition that it was income generating. Hmm. So we went and had a discussion with SKS Microfinance in Hyderabad, in their office. Okay. So they said, uh, mobile phone, uh, for us to give loans against mobile phones, let's think about it. So we convinced them finally. Okay. And then we went, did this pilot in uh, Orissa, and uh, we thought, great idea, we've done this, we've cracked it, microfinance we have, we have a mobile phone, went there. Done. Day one, not one woman bought a phone. The group, 30 people. I'm sitting there and saying, uh, no, first day, you know, because you know, they wanted to show it, we wanted to show that we're doing something, you know, path breaking, absolute disaster. So one of the men said, sir, it's fine, 75 rupees per week is fine, phone is fine. Where is the SIM card? <laughs> <laughs> and we said, bloody hell. It's, <laughs> we just assumed. And see, this is the trouble of assumptions. Yeah. We assume she'll take this and go buy a SIM card. But what she was saying was, give me a full bundle. Yeah. If you're giving me 90%, why don't you go the last 10%? Yeah. Why are you so stupid, Mr. Shiv Kumar? So I said, absolutely <laughs> right. So I called Manoj from there. Yeah. And I said, Manoj, you know, I got this. He said, Shiv, I'll give you a free SIM card. Take it. Because we'll make money every month on it. Yeah. We sold 2 million phones to women that year. 2 million. At, uh, you know, whatever I told you, 1,500 uh, rupees or whatever it is. Hmm. 2 million came in. Now, the concept of the ecosystem. Nokia was the phone guy. You needed a SKS microfinance yeah. to make it easy payment. You needed Airtel for the SIM card. Only if all three worked, did that ecosystem work. Hmm. 
because women were taking loans to buy buffalo because a buffalo gave 4 liters of milk, 20 rupees a liter, 80 rupees it is income generated. Or to you know, set up a sewing machine shop or a retailer shop. So working with the ecosystem ensured that we gave her a complete answer and we did the thinking for her. Yeah. So in my book always, please ensure that you partner with your ecosystem. When you partner with ecosystem, Swati, suspend your ego. Yeah. There is nothing called big and small. The trouble with ecosystem says, you go and say, I'm a bigger brand. I'm 1000 crores, you are 500 crores. Say, Don't do that. You should focus on the consumer to say, can we grow the pie between the two of us? If the answer to that is yes, don't worry whether you have 90 share or 40 share or 20 share. Never think about like that. As long as you're growing the pie. Once you keep growing the pie, you will make more than what you're making yesterday. So think ecosystems always, please. If there's one lesson to be learned for Indians now, is think ecosystem, which means collaboration. We are not naturally good at it. Yeah, no, a very beautiful example of how as a leader, you're not just thinking of your services, but you're saying, hey, what does my consumer want? Yeah. And what is that bundle that will make it attractive and then grow the pie, right? Absolutely. Amazon is another good example. Years ago, they took a call to say, we'll put third party products on uh, online. If they had just done their own products, they would have failed. Yeah. Think about it. More than 50% of the products sold on Amazon are non-Amazon products. That's the only way to grow the pie. Think ecosystem. And Don't then be it becomes the Amazon products Absolutely once they right. figure out what's best Absolutely selling right. here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, great examples, Shiv. Now, for those of, uh, you know, those of the students here who are thinking of identifying these white gaps in the market and probably trying something on their own, could, could you shed some light on where the industry is headed and where can new startups or new technologies uh, help in the, in the CPG industry? Yeah. I would say, uh, you know, some things which are obvious as daylight. Anything to do with health is obvious as daylight. But health comes with a lot of regulation. Remember that. Health comes with a lot of trust required to operate in health. It's not easy. So startups in health don't get trust credentials. Second one, obvious one again as daylight is education. Okay, education is big business. But education is big if you guarantee an outcome. Education is not big, big without guaranteeing an outcome. If Masters Union did not have uh, a starting salary of whatever you guys have, 3 million uh, rupees plus, etc., none of you will be here, trust me. <laughs> yes or no? Absolutely right. So all of education needs a outcome. For example, why would somebody send somebody to a school? The outcome there is top ranks. This school produces the best students in terms of ranks. That's why a parent sends saying, my kid will be more intelligent than where he or she is today. In professional courses like this, you want an outcome which is a good salary, a good company, etc. Without that, there's absolutely nothing. The third place you need to look at in terms of where opportunity could be is, look at the value chain of every industry. If the value chain has a lot of inefficiency sitting in it, then it's a great way to disrupt it. Okay. So if you take distribution as an example, every industry where the middleman has added no value has got killed. I want to repeat. Every industry where the middleman has added no value, the middleman has been murdered. Let me start with examples. The book industry. The book industry is completely digital today. The music industry. Is there a music shop in Gurgaon? Think about it. Ask yourself that. You know, when I grew up in Chennai at IIT, we used to go to Sony Vision, which was a huge music shop. Like it used to be a, like, you know, going and picking that LP and listening to the Eagle song there or Dire Straits was like great, mm. you know, putting on those headsets and thinking, wow, I've arrived in life. You know, not true anymore. There's no music shop. The music shop is your bedroom, it's your living room. Okay, travel agent. Travel agent does not, he's not visited Bangalore. So if you ask him for a hotel in Bangalore, he has no clue. You know, look at all those three industries. The middleman added no value. An industry where the middleman 
or the principle itself is being challenged is banking. With ATM today, how many of you have been to a bank in the last one year? Half the class. I haven't been to a bank, I think in five years or more. Yeah. Okay. Now what happens with ATM? That's an interesting point you raise. When I go, I put it in, I get money out. My perception of what a bank should be has dropped. The operations involved with a bank and all that they do, I don't appreciate it anymore. So you really have to think hard, where are the places where the middleman has too much money with him and is adding no value? In every industry, yeah. it'll be challenged. Having said that, let me also tell you that there are challenges to this operation. Health. What do you think is the biggest problem doctors face in India? Money. Money? Anything else? Anything else? Anybody else? Anybody else? The biggest problem doctors face in India, if you go talk to them, is an over-informed Indian consumer. <laughs> yeah. You know, so I go to Swati and say, you know what, Swati, my head is dizzy, etc. She says, I think you have this. No doctor, I saw Google. Google. I, I saw Google and I did this. So a lot of the doctors call these patients Google doctors. You know, so the doctor, I've heard many doctors say, whenever somebody says it, they say, then you go, don't come to me. No, that is the first problem. The second problem only in India, nowhere else. I'll give an example is, I go to Swati, she tells me something. What's your name, ma'am? Luan. Huh? Luan. Luan. Then, after I finish that thing, I call up loan, second doctor, for next advice. Second opinion. Second opinion. For everything we want, first opinion, second opinion. Yeah. Okay. Anywhere else it doesn't happen. Hmm. Okay. So, you also have to use your, you know, idea very carefully to say, okay, what is possible. Years ago, imagine nowhere in the world is there an opportunity called a missed call business. Yeah. <laughs> India today... You do a missed call, you say, you like this product, give us a missed call, we'll get in touch with you. What a fantastic thing. Discovery is so easy. Yeah. So there are many opportunities which are possible as long as you have imagination. Uh, we went to the same uh, college, uh, Wharton. I had a fantastic uh, finance professor there, John Percival. And one of the things he said in the finance class still rings in my ears. He said, spend imagination before you spend money. Yeah. It's so true. You know, each of these businesses, truly ask yourself, can I reimagine this business? What can I do? What part can I do well? What part can I build an ecosystem and partner and really do that? That's where the work. No, great. And, and Shiv, I mean, imagination is not something that's easily taught or learned, uh, right? It takes time. Um, and you've been on board of many business schools, right? So what um, innovation or change is needed in the business schools, the way they are teaching, so that skills like these can be taught. I'll say something which might not make me popular, but I'll say <laughs> it all the same. Uh, the first thing is, if you have, if you are studying 100 case studies, drop 50 of them. They're useless. Okay. Keep 50 case studies. Why? Let me also explain. Uh, the case study as a method came from Harvard professors. The four professors were Leonard, Christensen, Andrews, and Gutt. It was the LCAG approach. That was what it was called. Then it became the SWOT analysis. Now, it's a very good shorthand for saying, you know, this is right with the company. This is not right with the company. This is the opportunity. This is the threat. But when you do SWOT analysis, and all of you do it, I have done it. I'm honest enough to admit it. You might not be honest enough to say it. When you do a case study, you're playing God. Because you're not involved with it. You can look from the outside and say what you want. Okay? Then events will play out, etc. And I've had a few case studies written on me and Harvard and Ivy, etc. If you have 100 case studies, do only 50. The balance 50, I would urge you, Swati, please get industry people with real problems they're facing. For example, today, there is a big debate in terms of Jio is giving IPL free on Jio Cinema. Hotstar and Disney have paid X amount of dollars to beam it to TV. Please bring three media professionals here 
And you as a class debate, who do you think the winner will be or the loser will be five years from now? Yeah. That is hypothesis building. In a very fast changing world, you need to build hypothesis. A case study is a rare view mirror. You're looking back. That's not going to develop your critical thinking skills or problem solving skills. So take each of them like that. Tomorrow you say, for example, Gurgaon has excess office capacity. What do you think we can do with that? Build a hypothesis. The good thing about the hypothesis is that there's no right or wrong answer, but it's testing your ability to think. So I would say the future in all business schools belongs to people who can think structurally, who can think critically, who can imagine a different world. Please do that. Whatever you're doing, take my advice for it. Whatever you do, you'll be very successful if you do that. A lot of food for thought for us as a business school as well. Sure. I'll give you an example. How many of you are watching IPL? Excellent. What's the new innovation IPL has bought in this year? Impact Player. Great. And I was on a podcast yesterday with Sundar Raman, ex-CEO of uh, IPL, and we were discussing this. Imagine if Impact Player came to test match. Think about it. Day one, you have a pace bowler. Day three, the pitch is spinning. Bring in a spinner. How competitive will life be? Test matches will no longer be boring. That is what I mean by hypothesis building. Yeah, fair. So last question from our side, Shiv. Uh, you've written two books, Art of Management and the Right Choice. And you talk about changes in careers and how careers are changing. What is your advice to the students here who are going to graduate? how they should be thinking of career transitions and the choices they make about their careers. Yeah, the first thing I would say is your skill set must be good, whatever it is. What you want to do marketing, you want to do uh, finance, you want to do accounting, you want to do digital, you must be really good at it. Don't benchmark yourself to say, I'm the best in the master's union batch of 2023. That's a meaningless number. Don't bench yourself to say, I'm the best in business schools in Delhi in 2023. Or I'm the best in Gurgaon in 2023. Ask yourself, what stops you to say, how can I be the very best in the skill in the world? What stops me? What stops you is effort. Nothing else. The material is out there in the world for you to do. What stops you is effort. So whatever skill set you choose, ask yourself, how good can you be at it? Okay, How good can you be at it is something very, very important. For example, I said I want to specialize in marketing. I read every single marketing article in uh, the library uh, in those two years. Every single article. Believe it or not. Okay. Strategy. I did a term paper in strategy. I knew everything about strategy, even though I didn't do any strategy job till the end of my career. Okay. So, and I had six out of seven A pluses in my marketing grades. So, you want to do well, nobody can stop you. That's my point. So you pick your passion, but you say, I want to be the best at it. The very best, not ordinary best. There are many people who are ordinary best. Okay, the very best. That's number one. Number two, wherever you join, give it at least three years. Don't have ants in your pants at the end of one year. Don't do that. Not worth it. Because the company takes time to judge you. You take time to judge the company. You also have something to learn. They also have something to learn about. Okay, so three years. While you are at this, always keep learning something new. Keep progressing. Okay. Money is not the variable to judge your success. If you have money, it doesn't mean you're good. However, if you're good, money will follow you. I promise you. If you're good, there'll be a beeline outside your door for your talent at any point of time. Keep learning all the time. Next, contribute liberally to the ecosystem. Something I've done right through my career. You know, when I say contribute liberally, you leave class in the summer of 23, come back two years later, tell Masters Union, I'm happy to take a, you know, session. Go back to wherever you studied, Hans Raj, St. Joseph's, wherever it is to say, hey, uh, you know, principal, I'm happy to come and do a one hour session with students. Start contributing small. When you start doing that, you build your own personal brand. You build your own credibility. And the best way to know a subject is actually to try and teach it. It's very, very difficult. It's very easy to be a student. 
it's very difficult to be a teacher. So having a teachable point of view through your career is very important. Okay, so those are the things that I would say. Give it three years. Don't worry about money. You have a long career ahead of you. You guys have 30, 40 years of runway ahead of you. Okay, you'll all strike gold. Aim to be damn good at whatever you do. Okay, and in doing all this, if I have to encapsulate, you need focus. Simply stated, what is focus? We have 24 hours in a day. Assume we sleep for seven hours, eight hours. So let's take eight hours. We have 16 hours. 16 hours, the amount of time you spend on your passion minus the distractions. And you have a lot of distractions. You cannot say, I want to be good at marketing. I want to be good at blockchain. I want to be good at this, but I also want to party. I also want to see every movie released. I also want to go to the pub every Friday. Doesn't work. You have to be very clear. So the most successful people are very, very sharp about what distractions they avoid. However attractive the distractions are. Yeah. You have to avoid it. Only then will you be focused on your passion. So go back 24 hours, minus 8 hours sleep, 16 hours. Out of the 16 hours, how much time are you spending on your passion? Minus the distractions. The more distractions you can take out, the more successful you will be. On the path that you have chosen. It's your path. Okay. Yeah, no, thanks, Shiv. And I think this is very relevant for the students. We have a lot of incoming PGP and UG students here. And I think knowing that at the start of your okay. uh, class. Let me ask you. Th this is uh, two batches. Which batch is passing so out this graduating year? plus income. Which is the graduating batch now? Okay, fantastic. How many clubs are there on Masters Union campus? Huh? Okay, fantastic. Very well said. Out of the 17, except 3, the other 14 are useless. <laughs> I'm telling you right now. I, I'll tell you, I'm, and I'm being serious about this. Okay, I'm being very honest and serious about this. I talked of distractions. Yeah. I was on the I'm Vizag Strategic Review Committee. Mrs. Sudha Pillai was ex-planning commission person, me. Uh, Professor Murthy, ex-IM Bangalore director. And uh, Professor Sham Sundar from MIT. We went to the campus. They have a budget of 25 lakhs. I said, how many clubs do you have? 35 clubs. I said, are you guys stupid? Now, the reason, the reason why all of you want to belong to clubs is, you want to put it on your CV saying, I was on the alumni something cell. I was on this cell. I was vice president. I was the president of the bird watching club or whatever. <laughs> You think any employer is bothered? You must be mad. We don't look at your clubs to judge your leadership potential. So if I were to offer you advice, Swati, cut yeah. the clubs down to five. That's it. Be ruthless. Cut it down to five. Do a very good job on those five. Yeah. Do a very good job on those five. Those five clubs that you have, ladies and gentlemen, should be co-curricular clubs, not extracurricular clubs. Hmm. Co-curricular have a marketing club, have a finance club, have an investment club, have something, have an, you know, uh, let's say consulting club. Yeah. I'm all for that, but keep it co-curricular. That is what is more important for you to do. You know, for you know, 100 students, 17 clubs, come on, <laughs> give me a break. <laughs> so don't do that. So that's what I call classic distraction. Thank you. Thank you, Shiv, and a huge round of applause for Shiv.